Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at autoregressive moving average models. All right, so when we do autoregressive moving average models, we have an autoregressive part and a moving average part. And what we want to do, we want to use autoregressive portion and the moving average to model future values or to get deeper, get a deeper understanding into our time series. Now, something that's important about these types of models is that we have to have uh, state, the time series has to be stationary. So the average has to be constant. Also, the covariance needs to depend on the gap in time between the observations, not the actual value of time itself. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about where we're getting our information. So we are taking some examples from time series analysis and its applications. Here are the author's names, Robert and David. Here's our GitHub page and some other websites for you. And this textbook can be downloaded for free through UCF's library. Okay, so the definition of an ARMA, so autoregressive moving average model with parameters P and Q, degrees P and Q, is that we are going to have a, a lag on our autoregressive portion of degree P. And we're going to have a lag of degree six, sorry, degree Q, degree Q on our moving average portion. Now you'll notice here I have the actual value at the time we're interested in. And here we have no lag on our white noise portion on that. And then we have a degree P lag, sorry, degree Q, degree Q on our white noise. And of course, when we're talking about degree, the highest degree uh, terms are not equal to zero. And we're gonna say that we have constant variance uh, for any particular Point. So when I have a lag of zero, and I look at the covariance of lag zero, I get the same value every single time. All right, now, I said a moment ago that we had to have constant uh, expected value that still holds. But what we're going to do, if it's a non-zero constant, we're going to go ahead and add on a constant value to shift our time series so that when we work with it mathematically, we're building up our entire theory around having zero expected value. And if I need to convert back, I just use this alpha constant value to shift from whatever I have to whatever I need. Now, if P is equal to zero, then you'll notice that we don't have any autoregressive terms. So if this P is equal to zero, all of these go away. And I'm just left with a moving average. If Q is equal to zero, then the moving average portion is gone and we have an autoregressive model. Now, for the purpose of this video, we are assuming that we have non-zero P and Q because we're interested in the case where we have uh, autoregressive and moving average at the same time. All right, so what we're gonna do to get a handle on what's going on to, to help us work through uh, the mathematics of our, our model, we're going to move all of the autoregressive terms over to the left-hand side of the equation. So I'm going to have all the x's on the left, all the w's on the right. And so that's just taking the lagged autoregressive part and subtracting off from the left-hand side. All right. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to set up this lag portion on the observed and this lagged portion on the white noise. And if I look at that for a moment, I recognize that I could apply the backshift operator and I could, I could cr crunch down, reduce the amount of writing that I have for this equation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set this up is I'm going to, when you set, I'm going to create this, I'm going to connect it to an operator on the backshift operator that itself, after it's operated on, uh, works on the actual observed time series. Now over here, I'm going to connect this over to an operator on the backshift operator. And the operator on the backshift operator operates on 
the white noise time series. And so we can crunch this down, make this a lot more compact, a lot easier to work with into just that. Now realize that at, when I write it this way, this is kind of like an abstract algebra way of writing it, that we are saying that this is a function working on a time series. This is a function working on my white noise time series. Now, this presentation, why do we like this? Well, this illuminates a problem when we're building our model. Let's go ahead and let's say that this is the correct model, but we make a mistake. That mistake is I accidentally multiplied both sides by an operator on the back shift operator. All right, so what would happen? Well, if I do that, let's go ahead and say eta of the back shift operator, I made a mistake. I multiplied both sides by eta of the back shift operator. And what I do is I get a mathematically correct equation. All right, so if this is the correct model that I should be getting, that I want to have when I'm looking at my data, but I make an error in my model structure and I get this, then you'll notice I have this extra junk on the left-hand side of each portion of the equation. All right, well, clearly that is, if eta isn't a constant value, that's a problem. I don't want this. All right, so what this is going to lead to is going to lead to over-parameterization, and the author refers to this as parameter redundancy. Remember that whenever I'm building a model, if I have two models that uh, fit my data equally well, I want the simpler one of the, of the two. With this extra gunk eta floating around, I'm not going to get the simplest model possible. All right, so let's consider the simplest situation I could, we could really think of for this. Let's go ahead and just say that our time series observation, it's just white noise. All right, white noise means that there's zero correlation between, you know, observations of different time and, you know, there's just no relationship. It's just noise. All right. Well, now let's go ahead and let's say we made the mistake of multiplying both sides by this eta function on the backshift operator. And that function is the identity backshift operator that this does nothing. The author puts in a one for that, and that's consistent with abstract algebra. And then minus one half times the backshift operator. And so now, let's say I made the mistake of multiplying both sides of the equation when I was doing my modeling, doing my model exploration. I make the mistake of multiplying both sides of the equation by eta of the backshift operator. Okay, so now let's go ahead and mathematically work out what happens here. Well, I get my time series minus one half times lag value of one. And I get the white noise time series minus one half times the lag on the white noise. All right, now let's go ahead and uh, move everything over to one side and get, except for the actual observed value. Let's put the observed value on the left and put everything else on the right. This is consistent with the equation that we had at the very beginning of the video. Now, the correct model for this is an ARMA 0, 0 model. Here, P and Q would be zero. And so the correct model is ARMA zero, zero. But instead, when I was building up my model, I went ARMA one, one. All right. So in reality, our observation is just white noise, but we've missed that. We have said that there's something else going on. Now, if I go through, let's go ahead and just to see what happens. Let's see if we make that mistake, what would happen with R? All right, well, to do this, I'm going to set the C to 823. That's UCF on a phone, by the way. Look at the letters UCF on the phone, it's 823. And let's go ahead and, you know, we're doing white noise. So I'm doing, for the example, uh, to manifest it, I'm gonna use Gaussian white noise, 100 observations with a mean of five. And now let's go ahead and run a REMA model. So that's auto regressive integrated moving average. So the integration portion, we're just gonna have a degree of zero. 
and you'll notice that we have a degree one, degree one. Now check out what happens with this. You'll notice that here, I'm gonna have statistically significant. All right, so you know, just eyeballing it, if I double this, that's less magnitude. If I double the standard error, that's less magnitude than the autoregressive coefficient. If I take the standard error, double it, that's less than the moving average coefficient in magnitude. And so, hey, statistically, this looks like a significant model, but I know it's the wrong model because I built it, I created it. So this is something to help illuminate that this is a pitfall that you could fall into when you were building your model. And so when, when I look at the coefficients, you know, we can see what the, you know, it would be actually so. All right, so there are three major problems when we're doing ARMA models. There, there are three major pitfalls that we need to avoid. So we can have redundant models over parameterization, that is like we just looked at. We can have stationary autoregressive models that depend on future values. We talked about that in a, future, in a previous video. And we can have a situation where the moving average is not unique. We talked about that in the moving average video. All right, so let's you know, talk about um, autoregressive and moving average polynomials. Okay, so if, if I take the equation I had previously, and notice how I put all the autoregressive terms on the left, all the moving average terms on the right, what I can do, I can, can uh, connect the lag of the time series portion of each term and connect that to a power of a polynomial. And if I do that, I'm gonna get a polynomial for the left-hand side, and I'm gonna get a polynomial for the right-hand side. And now, of course, in this situation, since we're saying degree P, degree Q, the largest degree terms are not going to be equal to zero for the coefficients. And we're going to go ahead and allow our polynomials to be over the complex numbers, not the real. So the complex numbers are a larger set. They include the real numbers. All right, so something we're going to do to protect ourselves from redundant models is that we will require that the two polynomials do not have a common factor. So if I'm working on my model and I see, hey, it looks like I have a common root for each of my polynomials. What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna do polynomial division, divide out uh, that portion of the polynomial. And this will help protect us from incorrectly multiplying the correct model by an extraneous operator. Now, next thing to talk about is a causal autoregressive moving average model. So an autoregressive moving average model is said to be causal if the time series can be written as a one-sided linear process. And so here, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna say that my current observed value is equal to, now here, this is gonna be an infinite series. I'm gonna have a coefficient times the lag portion on the white noise and knows that there are infinitely many terms. And we're gonna call this psi of the backshift operator times the white noise series. Okay. And so to write this as a backshift operator operation is a psi of B is equal to the infinite sum of psi coefficients times the backshift operator. And that exponent of J is iterating the backshift. So if I had B exponent five, that's backshifting five times. Now, one thing that we're going to do to make the theory work out, to make sure that things are coherent and works out the way that we want them to, we're going to make the requirement that the series, the, the coefficients by themselves without the time series of white noise, without the backshift aspect, we're going to say the series defined by just the coefficients is absolutely convergent. Now, absolute convergence means that I can switch the order of my terms, infinitely many of them, and get the same sum. When I have a non, when I have a convergent, non-absolutely convergent series, if I is 
potentially possible that I can shuffle around the terms and get a different number than if I uh, shuffled the numbers in a different manner. And so what this is saying when I say that we have absolute convergence is that any order, if I was to take just the coefficients themselves and I shifted them around, shuffled them up in any way, shape or form, I'm gonna get the same sum every single time. And we're gonna go ahead and say that the very, the psi sub zero is equal to one because that makes sense in terms of how we wrote our original equation. All right, so now let's go ahead and do an example. So we're gonna do this easy peasy lemon squeezy. We're going to baby step in and we're gonna start with an autoregressive one model. All right, autoregressive one, we have a back shift of one to our time series and we're not having the moving average portion. We just have autoregressive and I've just got one coefficient. So we're not gonna subscript it. We're just gonna call it uh, phi. Okay, so now the causality of an ARMA PQ process, so it will a, an ARMA uh, model, it will be causal if and only if all of the roots of the psi of Z are outside of the unit circle. Now, remember, when we're talking about complex numbers, whatever degree I have up to multiplicity, that's how many roots I have for that polynomial. So if I have a degree five polynomial, I have five complex roots where we are double counting multiplicity on there. All right, so what we are saying is that all of the roots are outside the unit circle. Now, for our purpose, we don't care any deeper beyond that. We only care are the roots outside of the unit circle. Once they are, we don't care. So we want the smallest magnitude root to be outside the unit circle, we want the smallest magnitude root to be uh, greater than one. All right, and so how do we figure out this psi? All right, so we wanna be able to work out, so once I have a model, I wanna work out these details. I wanted to, uh, to figure out what's going on with the psi of z. And so what we're going to do is I'm gonna say that psi of z is equal to this infinite series. So the coefficient psi times z to the power of j infinite sum, we're going to say that this is equal to the ratio of theta of z divided by phi of z. All right, now what we're going to do to actually find these psi coefficients is that I'm going to multiply both sides by phi of z, and then I know all the values here. I have a finite number of values here because it's a polynomial, not an infinite series, and then I'm going to work out the details and just figure it out slugging through. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to say that z is less than one in magnitude for the infinite series. All right, so another way to talk about this property is that all the roots of phi need to be outside the unit circle. Now, an invertible autoregressive moving average model is when we have something similar, but you'll notice it goes in the other way this time. So previously I had a series involving the white noise. Now I'm gonna have a series involving the observed values. So I'm going in the opposite direction I was a moment ago. I've got the white noise individual term is equal to a series coefficients times the actual observed values lagged, added up all infinitely many terms. And so we're gonna have pi of the backshift operator is going to be the pi coefficients times repeated backshift operator. And once again, we're going to require that we have absolute convergence on the coefficients and just to be consistent with how we originally wrote our formula, we're gonna say that pi, of z, pi sub zero is equal to one. Now, how do we find these uh, coefficients? Same way we did with psi. So for the uh, series involving pi and the series involving psi, we're gonna do the same trick. All right, so to pull this off, what we're going to do is that I'm going, this fraction here, is the same as what we had, but it's a reciprocal. 
Now you'll notice that this time theta is on the bottom. So to figure out what is the infinite series pi of z, I'm going to multiply both sides by theta. I'm going to have a finite number of terms. And then I'm going to do multiplication on the left-hand side and just slug through this and work this out. All right, so let's go ahead and work through an example. Let's say that I have this model. I have that x of t is equal to 0.4 times shift 1 back, 0.45 times shift 2 back on the observed. Then I have white noise term, white noise shifted back by 1, plus a fourth times white noise shifted back by two. Okay, now in this presentation, everything's, you know, I, I don't have quite what I want to find the polynomial, so I'm gonna move all of the autoregressive terms to the left, all the moving average terms to the right, and I can see very easily what the back shift looks like. Now the authors of the textbook put this term as a one that's consistent with abstract algebra. I'm putting B to the power of zero to emphasize that this is an operator, not a number. All right, now I look at these two and I'm able to see that, well, I've got a coefficient of one, got a coefficient of negative 0.4, got a coefficient of negative 0.45, coefficient of one, coefficient of one, coefficient of one fourth. Okay, things are looking good. But, you know, just to make sure I go ahead, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and do some college algebra. I'm gonna factor this. All right, so I go ahead and factor, and I see that psi is equal to one plus a half times z times one minus 0.9z. And I notice that the right-hand side, theta, is equal to one plus a half times z squared. And I realize that we have a common factor for these two polynomials. So I know immediately that I have redundancy going on. This is not the best model for me to be working with. So what I want to do is just simplify it. So I want to reduce it down, reduce phi down to this, 1 minus 0.9z. And I want to get rid of the redundant part, which is one of the two powers. And then I want for theta, 1 plus 1 half times z. All right, and then I get this. All right, all right. All right, so now what are we going to do? So I want to find psi of z, that infinitely main terms, and I want to find pi of z because I want causal and I want invertible. Now, these may not exist. Maybe, maybe not. At this point, I don't know. I have to try and compute this. And if everything works out, it'll be great. And I'll be happy that I'll have the properties. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set psi of z. Remember that it's, there's infinitely many terms. So it is a series. I'm going to say that is equal to theta divided by, by phi, multiply both sides by phi, and replace psi for its series representation here. Now, what I'm going to do with this equation, it's beautiful. I'm just going to go through, do the college algebra on the left, and I'm going to start matching exponents on z. And that's how I'm going to find the coefficients of psi. All right, so now I'm going to take this 1 minus 0.9z, multiply both sides, mo multiply. I'm going to distribute the series. Okay. Now, I do things a little bit differently than the authors of the textbook. So I feel like it is easier to work with the subscripts. Now, the index of a series, first time you do this, a lot of students don't feel comfortable with this. But I find this to be by far the easiest way to tackle this type of problem. All right, so you'll notice that after I take this 0.9z and I multiply, z gets an exponent of j plus 1. Here I have an exponent of j. What I want to do, I want to get all of my indices to match up. I want the exponents of z to match, because what I need to do, I need to get the exponents of z to be the same. Then I'm going to group like terms off of z, which is the variable, after I do that, I'm going to compare to the right-hand side. So notice what I do. Here I have j plus 1. Here I have a j. 
So I, I reduced it by one. I've reduced the index by one. Here I have a J. I have a J minus one. I reduce the index by one. Now, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Wait, what, 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 what's going on? This doesn't make sense. How, how are you doing this? Well, hold on, hold on. Here's the trick. Here's the trick. I subtracted here. I subtracted. So I subtracted on the inside. I have to add on the outside and it ends up, I'm going to get exactly the same terms. So here, when I subtracted, I add one, I add one, and I'm going to get the same actual series. So with this zero, when I add one to it, it becomes a one. This infinity, when I add one, it becomes infinity plus one, which is just infinity. All right. So this trick is fast. This is quick. This is easy. Unusual the first time you do it, but this works out exactly the way we want it to. Now, you'll notice that I have z to the power of j in both of these. This means that when I go to combine my, my terms, I want group-like terms based off of the exponent of z. Everything's going to work out exactly the way I want to. But there's one more step. You'll notice that the index here starts at 1. The index here starts at 0. Those don't match. The index here starts at infinity or ends at infinity. The index here ends at infinity. All right. So what has happened is that this series has a constant, but this one does not. So what I'm going to do, the one that does not have that constant, I'm going to pull it out. And boom, it's right here. You'll notice I pull out phi sub zero from here. Z to the power of zero is one. So don't even worry about that. Now the subscripts, the superscripts all match up perfectly. So I've got infinity, I've got infinity. I've got one, I've got one. And the exponent of Z matches the exponent of Z. Now I'm writing on the left-hand side to combine like terms. And when I do that, boom, look at that. Everything has cleaned up nicely. I, and I've got this down to a constant plus a series on Z. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the left-hand side and I'm going to go by the exponent of Z. I'm going to match it to the right-hand side. The right-hand side, I have a constant of one and I have one half times Z to the power of one. All right, so I know that the constant on the left has to equal the constant on the right, equal to one. I know that the Z to the power of one has to match z to the power of 1 on the right. OK, so I know that when j is equal to 1, this has to equal 1 half. OK, and so just to make this a little bit easier, I went ahead and pulled that out in this presentation. When I'm doing this in real life work, this is exactly what I do, is that when I'm matching things up on the right hand side, what I'll do, I'll take everything that directly matches and I'll pull that out and I'll leave all the other uh, terms, all the infinitely many ones that are left over and leave those floating by themselves. And why do I do that? Because it, the math is going to be easier in a moment. So in a lot of ways, this takes some tough sledding in the beginning, but once you got it, boom, you got it. I, I feel like this is the least prone to mistake method possible. So I know that Psi of zero is equal to one. I know that this coefficient, when I have a power of one to z, it has to equal this coefficient of a half. Boom, I've got that. And now I have this equation. Now, if I look at this for a moment, I'll realize that's, that's equivalent to multiplying the previous value by 0.9. Huh. Well, if I just sat down and started writing this out, pencil and paper, which is what I did, I'll quickly realize that this gives me a formula, psi sub j is equal to 1.4 times 0.9 to the power of j minus 1 for all j greater than 0. Let's see, that, that should be greater than... No, that, 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 that. Yeah, uh, yeah, greater than zero. That works out. All right. Now, when I look at this, I realize that, you know what? This isn't quite the best way to be doing this. 
I can clean this up just a little bit. What I can do is if I multiply and divide by 0.9, I can make it so the exponent here is j. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply and divide by 0.9 on this. Multiplying and dividing by the same number doesn't change the number. And so you'll notice that instead of having 1.4 times something to j minus 1, I have 14 over 9 times 0.9 to the power of j. So now my lag directly matches that exponent. Why do we like this? Well, here you'll notice that my exponent doesn't, doesn't perfectly match the exponent of 0.9. The authors didn't do this in the textbook. This is just one more step. I find that this is a cleaner, better presentation. All right, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the equation I just discovered here to compute the values and get the coefficients. And so here, I'm just going to do that so I know that I have a constant of 1. And so now here is the equation of 14 over 9 times 0.9 to the exponent. And I can see the values. R is computing it out for us. Now, in base R, we have a function that will do this computation for us like that. All we have to do is give the coefficients of the autoregressive portion and the moving average portion and it'll just work it out for us. We just have to say was the maximum lag that we want. And you'll notice that we get exactly the same values, except it drops that constant term, that constant of one. That's important to realize when you're doing your actual interpretation of your model. Now for psi, it's exactly the same trick. What I'm going to do, I'm going to say that pi of z is equal to my time series, or the, excuse me, the series on z, which is equal to the fraction of phi divided by theta. And we're going to say that z is less than 1 in magnitude. All right, well, what we're going to do, we're going to multiply both sides by theta. And we're going to replace pi with its series. And we do the same trick we just did. So I'm going to distribute the series across the parentheses. That gives me this. Now I'm going to work to make sure that the powers of z match up. So I have j plus 1. So what I need to do on the inside, I subtract 1. So this has become j. This will become j minus 1. Now I'm subtracting on the index. On the inside, that means I have to add on the outside. And so the, I, when I add 1, this 0 becomes a 1. This infinity becomes infinity plus 1, which is just infinity. Now you'll notice, after I do all this work, the z's match up in their exponents. I'm ready to combine like terms. And let's do that. Now, something I want to point out this, at this moment is that that absolute convergence part that I talked about, the reason why we need that is to be able to go from this step here to this step. All right. In this presentation, I have infinitely many terms are being added up. I have infinitely many terms are being added up. We do infinitely many summation, infinitely many summation, then we add them up. This looks the same in finite arithmetic, it would be. But there is actually a difference if we don't have absolute convergence. Without absolute convergence, this is a this could be a very different number. All right, so here what I'm doing is I'm doing the summation on individual terms, then I'm doing infinitely many of them. And so the order of the addition is different. If I did not have absolute convergence, I could get complete junk on this step. And there's a pitfall. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the right-hand side. I see I have a constant. I have a power of 1. I'm going to take out the constant. I'm going to take out the power of 1 term here. Now I'm going to take the constant on the left. has to match the constant on the right. The power of 1 on the left has to match the power of 1 on the right. And then I'm going to have all infinitely, infinitely many terms in the series by itself. 
I know that each coefficient has to equal zero because I don't have those powers on the right-hand side. And so then, boom, I get an equa system of equations. We work this out, and we've got this. And we see, once again, we have something that looks very geometric. All right, so we see that pi sub zero is equal to one. And I work out a formula for this. And you know what? As I'm looking at this, I realize that I don't like having j to the minus one. I'm going to multiply and divide by negative one half. If I multiply by negative one half, this becomes j instead of j minus one. And then I divide by one half. And boom, I've got that. And so now, here is my formula. And now let's go ahead and show what we get. I'm going to compute it manually. And you'll notice that I've got this series. I'm plugging in the formula here. And I've got this one for that constant term. And here I get my series. Now you'll notice for the non-constant, each consecutive one is half of the previous. And I flip the sign, which is exactly what we expected here. All right, so you'll notice that here I go negative 1.4, positive 0.7, negative 0.35, and so on. It's getting cut in half each time we get to the next one. Now, the ASTSA package gives us a function that will compute this for us. Now, if I want to go from move, uh, autoregressive moving average to autoregressive, I need to use the ASTSA package. If I want to go from auto regressive moving average to a moving average model, like we did previously, that's a base R function. We just drop the coefficients in. We tell the max lag. And then we check and see what we got. And in fact, we get, we get exactly the same numbers. But once again, the function drops that constant of one. Be mindful of that when you're interpreting the results. All right, so here's an example of uh, causal conditions for an autoregressive two process. So autoregressive two, we're going to have two coefficients on there. And uh, we need to set up so that the, the root is outside of the unit circle. All right, so now if I have degree two going on on that back shift operator, You'll notice that this becomes a lot more complicated than what we've looked at so far. What we looked at so far, everything kind of just worked out to be like geometric. And so it's pretty easy to do the calculations. Here, it's not as obvious. Now, it's still only a quadratic, though. So here, I've got a quadratic for my polynomial. And you'll notice I don't have a moving average term. I only have the autoregressive portion going on. So if I had moving average, it'd be even more complicated. Now, I want everything to be outside of the unit circle. That means that both of the roots using the quadratic equation have to be greater than one in magnitude. Now, the author of the textbook has worked this out. I didn't work this out myself. But the coefficient, to get what I want, the first coefficient is equal to the sum of the reciprocal of the roots. The second coefficient is going to be equal to negative one times is a one divided by the product of the roots. And it's going to work out that we're going to have a straight line on the left, straight line on the right, that when we have positive roots, they have uh, our coefficients have to be below that line to get the result we want. And it's going to work out that phi sub 2 has to be greater than 1 in magnitude at all times. Now, this is not sharp inequalities. I'll show you these sharp inequalities in a moment visually. Now, here is another way to write out the polynomial. The reason why we write it this way is that for the analysis that resulted in these inequalities, it's easier to work with this presentation here of phi. All right, so now I want to use code to show you where are the actual coefficients to, to make sure that I have uh, roots with uh, greater than one magnitude. Now, this, all this code is just all about working out all the possible values. Uh, I've tinkered around with the cutoffs on this. 
but we're going to let the first coefficient go from negative three to three just to explore, just so you visually can see what's going on in a moment. And we're going to let the second coefficient go from negative two to one. And then the rest of the code is just crunching out the details of the quadratic polynomial and the roots that we get. The punchline here, after all this work, I'm, I'm going to go up, I'm going to scroll slowly so that you would be able to capture this. And I'm plotting with ggplot. All right, so now here's the punchline. So I've used data to establish this. What we want, we want our roots to be outside of the unit circle. And so the region that we want are the green. So in the green, we have complex roots that are outside the unit circle. And in the purple, we have real roots outside the unit circle. And you'll notice that we have this straight line triangle region going on for so if phi sub one and phi sub two are inside as a pair inside this triangle, then we are going to have uh, the results that we want in terms of invertible and causal for our uh, degree two autoregressive model. And you can see that in the green region, in fact, it's going to be complex. Now, so far, what we've talked about doesn't really matter if it's complex or real, but just let you know where it's at. And then we can see that if we have two, uh, if uh, phi sub two is less than negative one, automatically we have a, uh, you know, we have a problem in terms of our roots. Now the authors of the textbook wrote code to show the same thing. I want the difference here is that they mathematically worked out the details and then they plotted the results. The code that I just showed you with all the colors that is uh, generating the polynomial, computing its values and then plotting the points in, in a manner to show you visually what's going on. The theory way is the better way, but it's always good to do computa computations to confirm. And so here inside this triangle is where we will have a causal and invertible process. And we can see we, uh, this region has real roots, this region has complex roots. All right, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.